earthquake in the city. New York City as an example based on sediment supporting skyscrapers. This is a USGS report after the recent quakes that we've had in Ridgecrest, and thank goodness it wasn't any closer to Los Angeles, but we're also expecting major earthquakes, the big one, for example, in the southern San Andreas section, and also the north and also the middle of the San Andreas, we're expecting mega quakes. But these are areas that have high-rise buildings. These are also areas that have landfill, they could have liquefaction, and that's bad news for high-rise in the areas. Now, from what I've been reading lately from research done by geologists concerning what would happen to an area that had a major earthquake that was uh, populated, high population, a high amount of weight on, on the structures on the uh, subsoil, what would happen? What does that mean? Well, one study, source-dependent amplification of earthquake ground motions and deep sedimentary basins, geophysical research letters, and I'll leave a link below for you. Their abstract says, deep sedimentary basins amplify long period shaking from seismic waves, increasing the seismic hazard for cities in these basins. They said we performed 3D simulations of point source earthquakes distributed around the Seattle Tacoma basins, for example, in Washington state, to examine the dependence of basin amplification on source azimuth depth and earthquake type. For periods between one to 10 seconds, the pattern of amplification is spatially heterogeneous and differs considerably with the source to site azimuth. For close-in earthquakes, the greatest basin amplification occurs towards the far side of the basin and ground motions from crustal earthquakes experience greater amplification than those from more vertical incident, deeper interplate earthquakes. The Love and Rayleigh waves form similar spatial patterns for a given source location, although the magnitude of amplification varies. The source dependence of basin amplification is an important factor for seismic hazard assessments both in the Seattle and Tacoma basins and by extension for deep sedimentary basins worldwide. Okay, that's having to do with the Seattle, Tacoma. We know we've had recent earthquakes there. That is an area where they're waiting for a big one. That's in the Cascadia Arc. And then we're going to seismology earthquakes in the city, taking, for example, the example of New York City, the Wall Street area, if you look at the map, the seismometer array in New York City to record ambient noise, they have, um, you can see those little red triangles are their seismometers. The yellow is rock. The green uh, is hard rock. The light brown is dense soil. And the pink is soft soil. So between the soft soil and the dense soil, you see that that's over half of Manhattan. Uh, basically up to uh, Chelsea Park, okay? But definitely the Wall Street area is soft soil. Now, how seismologists can use noise to see under the ground? He says, uh, we, we usually think of noise as a bad thing. Noise during the quiet part of the orchestra performing is annoying and ruins the music, static on the telephone, making it difficult to hear. And when you want to record an earthquake, noise can interfere with the data signal. The great deal of time and effort goes into finding sites for seismic instruments that are quiet and into removing noise from recordings of the earthquakes. But what information can we learn from that noise that can help us understand earthquake hazards and ground shaking? So to help answer this question, scientists have been seeking out noise city blocks, noisy city blocks in urban areas to record seismic signals in, in terms of an earthquake or seismic recordings. We first have to understand what noise means to a seismologist. What is noise? It's traditionally anything that is recorded on a seismic instrument that is not caused by an earthquake. 
This can be anything from electronic equipment noise to a running air conditioner, to a nearby freight train or to a truck passing by, to a cow wandering close to an instrument in the pasture. Sometimes scientists will use large equipment to produce a large thump to approximate a very tiny earthquake if they want to observe and record what happens to this man-made seismic signal as it travels through the Earth's crust in a certain area. In this case, the thump is the signal and the cultural noise is undesirable. Earthquake hazards. Both earthquakes and thumps are used by scientists to study characteristics and properties of the Earth to determine what the shaking would be like in different areas from future nearby earthquakes to estimate damage those earthquakes might cause. The chance that a nearby earthquake could cause shaking and the amount of shaking it could cause is called the earthquake hazard. Since large earthquakes in urban areas where we care most about the hazard are infrequent, scientists use small earthquakes to approximate what would happen in a larger one. In the same way, they use man-made thumps to create a seismic signal that can be used like a small earthquake. Estimated VS30, average S-wave velocity to 30 meters depth, requires the collection of data to measure soil and rock velocities. The traditional method for collecting these S-wave velocities requires drilling a borehole and lodging S-wave velocities down the well. Many newer methods have been developed to estimate VS30 without requiring borehole drilling and logging. One of those methods, shown above, uses ground thumps to get soil layer thickness and S-wave velocities for calculating the, S, the VS3 as a site, at the site. One important measurement that is used in earthquake hazard assessments is the average shear wave velocity at the top 30 meters, or VS30, and what uh, let's di dissect and explain that. It says the shear wave, or S wave, is typically the second fastest seismic wake after the P. First you get the P, which is small, then you get the S wave. Uh, the, an S wave shakes the ground back and forth perpendicular to the direction that it travels, and is typically the type of shaking that causes the most damage in an earthquake. The velocity of the shear wave, the speed that it travels as it moves through the ground, is different depending on the type of soil, as we know, or rock that it's moving through. So the average shear wave velocity in the top 30 meters is the average speed that an S wave can move through a particular 30 meter column of soil as measured from the Earth's surface. S waves move faster in hard rock than they do in the soft sediments. So S waves tend to cause the most shaking and therefore potentially the most damage in sedimentary basins like those under Salt Lake City, Utah and Los Angeles, California. And it's from what we see here, for example, the lower part, lower half of New York City, especially in the Wall Street area. Now, uh, the most direct but also most invasive way to obtain the SVS-30 is to drill a borehole and measure the S-wave velocities down the well, but that gives you a measurement at only one location, and drilling can be expensive. Non-invasive surface methods typically utilize an array of many portable seismometers to record data that is used to determine the VS-30 as a series of locations in the study area. Because data collection is relatively fast, scientists using non-invasive methods can rapidly obtain many site measurements. The, in addition to the VS-30 S waves, velocities to depths greater than 30 meters are also very important for understanding how earthquake shaking can vary in urbanized sediment basins. Currently, scientists are exploring the use of techniques that rely on noise to obtain an estimate of S-wave velocities to depths of several thousands feet of feet. Seismology in the city. One of the non-invasive techniques they use to obtain VS-30 and deeper S-wave velocity, the spatial autocorrelation or SPAC method, especially well suited for working in urban areas with high levels of ambient noise. 
This method takes advantage of the coherency of the ambient noise, the fact that it's continuous coming from all directions, as it travels across a small array for obtaining S-wave velocities for the soil and rock layers. Once the unwanted portions of the ambient noise are removed, the data that's left is what the scientists use to figure out the soil and rock layering beneath the targeted area, and then utilize, utilize the information to estimate the earthquake hazard. The process begins by setting up at least four size monitors bounding the area of study, usually using the existing roadway and sidewalk to establish seismometer locations. And next, these seismometers record the ambient noise for up to several hours. Instruments are picking up and then all data, thereafter they're picked up, all data processed and done back at the office in the SPAC ambient noise studies that have been done to date in different cities. There often has been existing sparse data from boreholes and other methods scientists could use to correlate and check the accuracy of the results. With each successive experiment, scientists have been able to refine the process, obtaining data to greater depths of the crust, providing better and more information for the hazard assessment. Now, in conclusion, concerning the high-rise in these cities, we're talking about Seattle, Tacoma, Los Angeles, New York City, from the past USGS and architectural articles that we read, basically, unless buildings are retrofitted, which very few are, these buildings cannot stand over a magnitude 7 earthquake. And this is also something confirmed by my parents, who were, of course, as I told you in the past, architects in New York City, working for the biggest engineering firms there, and, of course, working on high-rise buildings. I'll leave links below for you for this on USGS. If you'd like to join me on my Patreon account, you will hear content not covered by mainstream media. These riveting stories will be based on my research and I will state my opinions and give my personal insight on diverse and controversial subjects and world events, events not covered by mainstream media and not certainly on, not supported by YouTube guidelines. So whatever I have on my Patreon, most of those will not be on my YouTube channel. Please consider becoming a member today. More of the, the most significant and important videos will be on my Patreon channel. Your support helps me to continue my research and keeps this YouTube channel alive. And we depend on your support, your generous charity, because we help economically challenged families here in Athens, Greece, in Kapota, and we also help the young generation with university tuition and the community around our church. Thank you.